Zwerf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Welcome to this Zwerf Buffy Bocconi e lecture on the sovereign borrowing outlook for 2022 and beyond. Navigating shocks and uncertainty with high debt. My name is Ernest Knan. I'm Secretary General of Swerf and Counsel to the Board at the OMB. COVID has left deep scars in public finances. The economic recovery is dampened by the war in Ukraine and Western sanctions. Higher inflation does not automatically lower debt ratios to the extent that it stems from foreign cost push sources. The tightening of the monetary policy stance needed to combat inflation confronts debt managers with higher future refinancing costs and in vulnerable countries rising risk spreads. This has in turn prompted the ECB to work on tools to contain the fragmentation of financing conditions across Euro area countries. Announcements to this effect have shown immediate effects on spreads. NGEU has entered the European sovereign debt scene with considerable issuing volumes. Government measures to dampen the energy price shock, to speed up the energy transition, and to beef up defense spending add to government's borrowing needs. Against this background, this workshop presents key findings from the OECD's Sovereign Borrowing Outlook 2022. We're privileged to have with us today Fatos Coach, Head of Public Debt Management Unit at OECD, to present the key findings from the Sovereign Borrowing Outlook 2022 for the first 30 minutes or so. Then, three top experts will discuss the OECD report. We have Claudia Bras, Banco de Portugal, and Chairperson of the Working Group on Public Finances of the European System of Central Banks. We have Maria Karcheva, Deputy Head of Investment and Treasury at the ESM, and Martin Larch, Head of Secretariat of the European Fiscal Board. Without further ado, Fatos, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ernest, uh, for this nice introduction. Today, we'll be discussing uh, the outlook for sovereign issuers and also borrowing conditions going forward. But before moving to the, my presentation, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to tell you more about uh, how we um, uh, prepare this uh, publication. This uh, publication mainly draws on uh, responses received from uh, an annual survey. It's indeed a couple of surveys together. Uh, we ask countries uh, borrowing needs, their perception of uh, secondary market liquidity conditions, and also the changes in, in primary market uh, practices. So we put together the survey responses and then uh, prepare the, this outlook um, annually. And this edition of the outlook, uh, so borrowing outlook, presents uh, analysis of the impact of the pandemic, indeed, first. Um, of, of the pandemic on sovereign borrowing needs and outstanding debt for 2020 and 2021. And it provides also projections for 2022. Uh, this is all for the OECD area. And also another chapter reviews sovereign debt issuance trends in emerging market and developing countries in 2021 and provides an update on the impact of the COVID crisis on their issuance conditions. Uh, the third chapter then takes the perspective of a public debt manager and discusses the approaches to incorporating ESG factors into public debt management, which means uh, their uh, ESG labeled bond issuance and also uh, changes in investor uh, and communication practices. So uh, having said that, uh, let me now uh, turn to my, my presentation. If we can move to the first slide. Yes, this presentation covers uh, mainly the first two chapters of this publication. I uh, will be talking about main features of uh, sovereign borrowing and in, in coming out of pandemic, how countries uh, plan to issue. And then also uh, looking at the outlook, downside risks to the outlook mainly, unfortunately, we'll be talking about. And um, lastly, near medium term policy considerations for, for sovereign uh, debt managers. So, um, but of course, we'll be discussing more uh, in the Q&A session uh, with our panel discussions uh, later on. Uh, but let me start uh, first with the main features of the sovereign borrowing um, 
what happened in 2020, 2021, and what we are expecting from 2022 uh, in terms of the warming needs of OECD countries. Can we move to the next slide, please? Yes, uh, well, how, how did we get into the crisis? What was the position of, uh, of debt levels and, and interest uh, payments? Uh, it's just I wanted to take a step back and then show you uh, that the fact that the borrowing uh, in terms of uh, debt levels, uh, debt to GDP ratios were already high uh, before the pandemic. Um, it was high in terms of the debt to GDP ratio, but when we looked at the uh, the graph on the on the right hand side, we see that interest payments uh, as a percentage of percentage of GDP uh, was uh, declining. Uh, this was thanks to, of course, uh, first. Uh, low interest rate environment, and then second, uh, economic growth. Uh, this all happened uh, in the back of uh, kind of a uh, favorable uh, borrowing environment. So this was a picture before we get into the crisis. Then what happened next? Uh, if you go to the next slide. So um, in 2020, uh, the, the pandemic uh, was a shock, of course, uh, to economic conditions, social conditions, as well as to, to uh, sovereign borrowing needs. Um, many countries uh, had to increase their borrowing needs um, just to, of course, meet government's borrowing, higher borrowing needs uh, to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. So what happened? Uh, their, uh, their borrowing needs surged uh, in 2020, in the second half of uh, the, the year, and um, we we see this sharp increase uh, on the on the figure. So I don't need to I think explain. It is self evident from the figure. But later on in in 2021, um, the uh, economy is kind of rebounded well, and it affects of course uh, the uh, tax revenues and also it reduces the the uh, necessity to uh, to um, to support economic growth. So their borrowing needs uh, kind of uh, declined a little bit, not too much, but stabilized. And uh, also 2022, uh, we were expecting uh, some uh, continuity of this uh, stabilization. Uh, but uh, I should, I think, uh, indicate that uh, this uh, Figures have been collected before the uh, the invasion of Ukraine, so uh, we didn't cover uh, the impact of the uh, of the war in these uh, projections. And as you can imagine, the war, uh, the, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, came as an economic and social shock, um, and uh, we're expecting um, in the impact on fiscal um, fiscal figures in in 2022 and 20. 23, and not just the direct impact, of course, so we see the impact uh, through uh, commodity prices and, and food prices. Um, let me now turn to the uh, next page where we are uh, kind of uh, diving into the details a little bit more. Uh, new borrowing needs, so you see uh, the, um, the OECD area, new borrowing requirements on the left hand side, and then for emerging market economies on the right hand side. And uh, you'll see that uh, you know, compared to pre-pandemic period, uh, the net borrowing requirements increased uh, significantly in 2020, but then it reduced down in 2021. Uh, just in terms of the nominal figures, uh, before the pandemic, on average, net borrowing needs were around 1.5, 1.6 trillion dollars, and then with the pandemic, uh, it increased to 6.5 trillion dollars. Just it was a huge increase. But uh, as you know, they, a, a part of this increase was uh, kind of observed by the central banks. And um, in, in 2021, the number went down to 5.7 trillion, a little bit lower than uh, the, the pandemic period. And for 2022, we were expecting this to be around uh, 3.9 um, four trillion dollars. This is in terms of net issuance. So this means that we exclude here uh, the redemptions. So this is just new kind of uh, uh, borrowing needs. And for uh, emerging market economies, the situation was a bit different, of course, especially for low income countries, their access to markets were limited in 2020. So what we have seen is that for low income countries, their uh, 
kind of new debt issuance was increased uh, in 2021 rather than uh, 2020 uh, because they were unable to access markets. But the rest of the EMs, uh, um, especially uh, middle income, high income countries, their borrowing needs uh, were increased uh, during the pandemic, but later on it reduced um, uh, significantly. So uh, this was the picture uh, in terms of net borrowing needs. If we can uh, go to the next slide. Yes, uh, it's just this ch chart uh, shows the, the impact of the COVID on uh, debt to GDP ratios. Um, this, uh, we take central government debt to GDP ratio rather than public debt. I mean, they, they uh, kind of a uh, wider scope. And the aim is to just to show you the, the impact of the crisis compared to what happened in, in, in uh, 2008 financial crisis. So uh, when we look at the figures here uh, and the change between 28 and uh, 2008, 9, and then uh, the one between uh, 2019 and 2020, you see the big Im impact of the COVID. It's higher than the global financial crisis impact. So it's important to point out that, you know, if even before the pandemic, the debt to GDP ratios were very high, thanks to uh, the global financial crisis and the following, of course, Euro area debt crisis. But then uh, on top of that, uh, there, there was another uh, kind of shock hit uh, to debt to GDP, GDP ratios. Uh, and then uh, with COVID, um, now they reached their uh, record high levels in, in many areas, G7, Euro area and others. Uh, can we now move to the next slide, please? Yeah, well, this was the kind of general picture. When we look at the uh, the media and headlines, uh, they all uh, talk about debt to GDP ratios. Therefore, I wanted to start with the borrowing means and debt to GDP ratios. But uh, one also needs to look at uh, the the composition, maturity composition of of the debt borrowings, and also uh, uh, other features such as uh, investor base, such as uh, uh, interest rate composition, and others. In, in, in order to be able to say more about uh, countries' uh, um, debt uh, positions. So on this slide, we see borrowing maturities. Um, during the pandemic, what we have seen, uh, Ernst, that the countries tend to uh, issued in um, short-term uh, interest rates, especially bills they used uh, in, the, in the wake of the pandemic. We have seen a, a big surge in uh, and the share of treasury bill issuance um, during the first couple of months of the pandemic. But later on, um, the issuers uh, kind of extended their maturity profiles. And we've seen this impact in the, in the overall uh, borrowing maturities in 2021. So what happened is uh, you see on the on the chart on the, on the left uh, the, the short term, the, the share of short term uh, maturities in total borrowings went up to almost 50% uh, of the total borrowing, 47. Uh, this, is, uh, this is much higher than pre-pandemic levels. But then, uh, as, as I explained, the uh, kind of playbook uh, suggested that they extended the maturities when the conditions have improved. Uh, and uh, so they did in 2021, uh, share of uh, short-term uh, instruments, basically treasury bills, uh, declined. Uh, back to their pre-pandemic periods. So on the right-hand side, you see the chart for the emerging market economies. For them, uh, as I said, uh, just uh, the situation was a bit uh, more complex because uh, some haven't uh, had the, the market access in the first couple of months. And then once they had the market access, it was very volatile. And then and uh, the ones kind of had access to international bond markets, they had the opportunity to extend their maturities, but the ones, especially with low uh, credit ratings and uh, kind of uh, no access to international uh, debt markets, the situation was uh, kind of uh, much uh, worse for them. And then they had to, uh, to rely on domestic resources and their uh, borrowing maturities remained low. So uh, when we uh, move to the next uh, slide, we see this average, the, the impact on the debt. Uh, this is uh, 
this chart shows the average term to maturity of outstanding marketable debt uh, in OECD countries. Well, on average, uh, the average term to maturity is around uh, 7.6 now uh, as of uh, 2021. Uh, I think before the pandemic, it was around 7.8 months. So it's just we are very close to pre-pandemic uh, levels. And um, but for some countries, especially UK, Chile, um, and um, and others, we see much higher average term to maturities. But all, but most of them was around uh, this uh, OECD average. Uh, I know that Italy is now making the headlines uh, in, in terms of Italy. Uh, it's uh, I think the average term to maturity is around seven point four or five. So it's very close to to OECD average. So why is this important as an indicator? It's just why we look at average term to maturity or, or maturities of the borrowing because it shows the how kind of fast uh, this rising interest rates would affect the, the overall outstanding debt and government's uh, interest expenditures. That's, therefore, it's important. So in a way that, you know, one shock to interest rates, if, if it's sustained, it would take 7.6 years, 7.6 years uh, for uh, to see uh, see the whole impact on 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 uh, uh, government's uh, interest expenditures. So we can say that uh, sovereign issuers made an attempt to lengthen their maturities and to mitigate their um, exposure to uh, interest rate increases. So uh, with this, we can move to the next slide. So uh, also what happened to the cost of borrowing? Of course, uh, it's a relevant question when it comes to uh, the, the debt dynamics. Um, what we have seen in, in uh, recent years, even before the pandemic, very low interest rates, even negative uh, in, in some jurisdictions, including Euro area, Japan, we have seen uh, that that sovereign issuers borrowed at negative interest rates, which means that instead of paying to investors, they were paid to, to issue debt. Uh, but it has been changing recently. Uh, these figures belong to 2021. Uh, so what we've seen is that here, uh, uh, 80% of the uh, borrowings made in OECD countries uh, with, with less than 1% of yield. Um, it, it, is, it is important to, to note this, that, uh, that, um, that the cost of borrowing, um, although it's been, uh, it has been rising in parallel with the rising inflation pressures recently, it's been very, very low and, uh, and the countries uh, share, raise, uh, raise the needs or uh, to to meet the borrowing um, to, to meet the um, to meet the budget deficit at very low levels. You see that Germany, France, Japan, uh, the interest rates were lower than zero uh, percent. It was uh, negative basically. So on the um, EM side, of course, they were not uh, in that position. Although. Uh, so look at, looking at the historical levels, the, the environment conditions were also very favorable for EM, EMEs. Uh, here on the, on the right hand side, you see the chart for their uh, US dollar denominated bonds. And um, except uh, um, for uh, African countries, overall uh, the, um, the rates for EMEs have been very favorable. Uh, well, in a way, it was good that they, they managed to, to borrow at low interest rates in international capital markets before the pandemic. But then, uh, the, of course, uh, the downside is that, uh, that uh, this increased their currency risk if, it's, uh, if, it's, uh, if it was unmanaged, so to speak, not, not hatched. So moving to the next slide. Well, overall, uh, up until uh, 2022, we had this kind of rosy picture so to speak, uh, countries needed to borrow, increase their borrowing uh, because of the pandemic, but they managed to do so uh, at low rates. Even they uh, extended their maturity profiles, but uh, now uh, um, sovereign issues face kind of uh, twin crisis, even maybe triple pressures, we can say. Uh, one pressure is that, of course, uh, general surgeon government borrowing and future borrowing needs are high. Um, 
first, as I said, uh, COVID and, uh, and other uh, demographic shifts uh, will uh, have this impact. Um, and then second pressure is, of course, inflation. Um, I don't have to, I think, explain uh, this audience uh, that the, the inflation has been uh, on the rise in, in, uh, in recent months, uh, more than expected. Both demand side and supply side shocks uh, had this impact. And uh, in, uh, in the latest economic outlook uh, for 2022, the, um, the inflation is expected to be to to be around 9% for OECD countries, which is really, really high compared to uh, to what was um, kind of uh, uh, the average uh, before the pandemic, even during the pandemic, it was very, very low. Um, so, um, well, of course, um, what we expect also uh, in the face of high inflationary pressures that we expect central bankers to to normalize uh, their um, their monetary policies and they have uh, started to do so even before uh, 2022 because of the demand side uh, kind of pressures on inflation but with the invasion of uh, Ukraine and other things the supply side shocks also uh, played a bigger role and then uh, the the pace of the monetary policy normalization is, uh, is kind of um, now uh, much uh, higher than expected, I would say. Uh, then, the, of course, it affects the, the um, interest rates on government uh, bonds and also uh, uh, borrowing conditions overall, the volatility. And uh, another impact, of course, we will see on the uh, investor base. We will get into the details of, of this impact later on. But uh, what I can say here is that just we face a high degree of uncertainty here. It's just uh, um, and it, it uh, kind of uh, exacerbates the, the two existing uh, pressures. Um, how long the war and the sanction will last, we don't know. Uh, what will be the geopolitical uh, landscape look like? Uh, we don't know exactly. And is the pandemic over? Um, and uh, yes and no, I think. Uh, and what is the nature of the inflation we are facing? It's a big question for for macroeconomists to, to deal with uh, nowadays. Um, but uh, with that, of course, uh, what we can say is that definitely uh, the, the borrowing conditions will be are different and will be different from the from the past uh, uh, years. So with that, uh, we can go to next slide, please. So uh, what we said here is that the, the uncertainty is is a key thing, and uh, when it comes to to borrowing from the market, what what matters is of course your financing needs on top of the new um, borrowing needs. And uh, because of the the surgeon uh, surgeon uh, borrowings during the pandemic, uh, we see kind of higher um, um, refinancing needs in, in coming years. Uh, on the left hand side, you see the debt redemptions of uh, government marketable debt as a percentage of uh, uh, total uh, debt stock, and you see that the, for OECD area for 2022 as a whole, the the Overall, um, that redemptions was around uh, 45 percent for the next three years, and for G7 it's a bit higher, and then for Euro area uh, it's a bit lower than than the average OECD. It's around 35 to 6 uh, percent. It the ratios are high. But it's not just the ratio, huh? because the ratio is uh, the debt redemption as a percentage of total debt. And when we look at that itself, it increased, the nominal debt has increased. So 45% uh, today, 40% today, and then three, two years before is totally different numbers. So, so the financing needs has elevated as a result of the pandemic. And also, of course, recently uh, it will be more uh, because of the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine and its uh, implications for, for fiscal policy. And on the right hand side, uh, you see the chart for the EMEs. You might say that uh, looking at the figures um, for EMEs, uh, the, the debt redemption uh, ratios are lower. Yes, but uh, 
given that um, often uh, they their access to to liquid bond markets is limited, and also uh, the the room for fiscal uh, manure is limited, is it is not a good sign for them as well, especially for low income countries. We see that their um, that redemption profile uh, worse than and compared to uh, high and middle income countries. And then the next slide, um, well, uh, also, uh, I'm sorry on the uh, credit conditions. Unfortunately, uh, I don't have a, a better picture to show, especially for emerging market economies. It's just we have seen a kind of uh, significant deterioration in their credit conditions uh, in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, and then uh, this condition, of course, uh, reflected on their um, quality of their uh, bonds. We see that, uh, except I think for Asia, um, the credit quality of EME uh, debt has has uh, unfortunately worsened. Well, it's a it's a kind of a mechanical result uh, when when they are downgraded, and uh, it happened uh, heavily during 2020. But unfortunately, their um, credit ratings haven't been improved uh, throughout 2021. So, with this, the next slide will show, um, we'll, we'll look more into um, to today's condition. Uh, as, as mentioned, there, uh, the um, borrowing conditions have changed. Uh, we were expecting, indeed, even in 2021, we were expecting monetary policy um especially if in the us the change in in 2022 but uh the impact of the war and uh, and difficulty in, in in supply chain um problems uh, that just the, the the pace of the monetary policy tightening was uh, was a uh, thing um it's been um worse than expected so what happened is that uh we have seen uh interest rates uh have risen uh, in the US, in your area, and it, it's it's as a result of, of course, uh, inflation and then uh, monetary policy action. And uh, on the right hand side, you, you see this uh, difference between December and April uh, period. Uh, you see, uh, you see very high um, changes on in, in 10-year benchmark yields uh, for some countries. On average, it's around one point uh, or so, but it's uh, it's much higher than average for uh, for especially uh, emerging market economies. So when we move to the uh, next slide, uh, we will be talking about a little bit of uh, downside risk to the out outlook. Well, first and, and most, it's the rising risk to the inflation outlook because uh, it will be an important uh, input uh, when central banks uh, make their um, decisions about uh, monetary policy tightening, uh, the pace and, and the coverage. And of course, another element will be the war in Ukraine and its blowers. And the fourth is, of course, emergence of new COVID outbreaks. Uh, you know, it's just uh, what will happen in, in, in China and other Asia, uh, Asian countries in terms of new outbreaks and how it will have an impact on, on uh, su supply uh, chain uh, bottlenecks, let's say. So with this, we can move to the um, next slide. Um, we talked about the, the kind of uh, current condition, uncertainty, and the potential risks and uh, how it will affect the, the countries. Uh, it's of course, when we look at the uh, countries uh, in terms of their debt levels, their access to maturity, the access to, sorry, uh, to uh, international capital bond markets and the liquidity in, in local currency bond markets, we see um, it's not uniform, I would say. We see uh, heterogeneity. And then, especially for emerging markets, uh, it's going to be uh, it's not going to be easy, as easy as uh, previous years. It's because they're the, the share of foreign currency issues in some uh, countries, it's been high, um, especially in, in many areas, uh, African 
uh, countries, we've seen a very high level of uh, foreign currency issues, uh, and uh, they will be redeemed or uh, refinanced, and the, the, the conditions were not as easy as before, not as favorable as before. So that's one thing. Indeed, uh, we have already seen some pressures in, in countries like Sri Lanka. We have been hearing from news um, in other Zambia. It's, uh, it's we see the, the pressure uh, already there. And, and uh, going forward, uh, of course, depending on countries' um, share of uh, currency, uh, foreign currency denominated debt, and also overall uh, that to GDP ratios uh, and, and political arena as well will play uh, an important role. But uh, you might hear uh, more about that in, in coming uh, months and years. So with that, next slide, please. Yeah, I, I also wanted to mention um, this. Uh, this is part of um, what we did uh, during the pandemic and afterwards, we asked countries um, the sovereign issues, uh, their um, kind of key lessons drawn from, from the COVID-19 crisis and what are the kind of policy implications of these lessons going forward. Um, so this was part of our survey um, study and um, you see the, uh, the results uh, from OECD countries. It's the number one uh, lessons learned from the COVID crisis is that the need to maintain short-term funding market. This is basically a treasury bill market because uh, it, it happened in uh, during 2008 financial crisis as well, but treasury bill market often um, play kind of an, um, price absorption mechanism. It's just uh, because the role of sovereign issuers to of course, meet the um, the um, government's uh, borrowing needs, but also uh, they want to do it without um, without putting additional pressure to the market, right? So short-term funding markets often liquid and easy to access. So it's uh, number one lessons they learn is that to maintain short-term funding market, it's the treasury bill market. And then the second is that established communication with investors. Well, in most OECD countries, as you can imagine, their um, communication with their investor base is already uh, very good and strong. But here also what we uh, ask is in terms of communication mechanisms and, they, and um, frequency. And what, they've, what we have heard from them is that they uh, kind of moved from more face-to-face -face communication to, of course, uh, digital uh, platforms like this one. Um, but uh, they also mentioned that they kind of broaden their um, perspective in terms of accessing investors, not just existing investors, but also potential investors become uh, more important for them. And then the third uh, issue mentioned is having kind of uh, different borrowing instruments, borrowing methods in hand. One example would be syndications. Um, in, in OECD countries, most of the case countries use, uh, use uh, auction as primary uh, um, borrowing method, but uh, what we have seen during the pandemic, they also use private placements, syndications, that kind of um, additional methods indeed uh, facilitate uh, the whole um, issues process and give flexibility to to invest uh, to issuers both issuers and investors indeed and then the other um, um, point they, they made is to to the need to hold excess cash balances this is what we call liquidity buffer um, they said it gives a kind of uh, flexibility also uh, to for many issuers in terms of their borrowing program. Uh, when, they, when the crisis hit, if, uh, if the, the market is volatile, they prefer to, to not to uh, issue through auctions or other borrowing methods, but use their liquidity buffer in hand without, uh, without um, increasing uh, the, uh, the borrowing needs uh, uh, through the market. 
So um, these were the main issues when it comes to uh, key lessons learned from the COVID and also for potential implications uh, when we ask, I'll go through them quickly, uh, giving the time limit. It's, uh, they said they will be uh, making more emphasis on their investor relations. I think ESG also uh, will be part of their investor relations in that sense. And also uh, adoption, adaptation of, of a business uh, continue to recovery plan. Um, they had it before, but uh, they highlighted that the, the need to review, uh, revise their um, existing VCPs. And then the other um, uh, topic is uh, again related to cash buffers. Uh, many highlighted that uh, they'll be adjusting their uh, cash buffers going forward. And then of course, issuance of new securities, lengthening average maturity, all on their agenda. So uh, moving to the next slide. So we are coming to the end of my presentation. Uh, the, it's a, the, I think it's the last slide. We will be talking about near medium term policy considerations for, uh, for sovereign issuers. Uh, first and most important, of course, we think that the outlook calls for, for very uh, kind of vigilant approach. Uh, it should remain, um, Vigilant, closely monitor the resilience of market intermediaries. Uh, this is very important for uh, secondary market liquidity and uh, coordinate with relevant authorities uh, because sometimes, uh, especially for cash forecasting, it's important to, to have this coordination between different parts of Ministry of Finance and also central banks to, to promptly address possible stress market conditions. And then the second uh, advice for them that they could uh, benefit from such tools, uh, such as security lending facilities, um, and also um, they can do buffers to absorb possible stress in, in markets. And uh, lastly, they may also, of course, uh, explore new borrowing instruments to support financing capacity. This is especially relevant for countries uh, who are their um, um, borrowing needs. Uh, increase in the coming uh, periods, not just one, what, one or two years, but if they're expecting uh, borrowing needs to be increased in, in medium term, long term. So I think with that, we come to the end of my presentation. Yes, uh, here on this very last slide, uh, uh, we put some uh, links, how we can uh, kind of find us online our uh, events and, and publications. With that, uh, now uh, I turn it to you, Ernst. Thank you very much, Fatos, for this um, extremely interesting summary of the report. I want to draw uh, the audience's attention to the fact that you managed now in 30 minutes to summarize this 200-page report. This is really an achievement. No, just joking. Uh, I would encourage everybody to really consult this important document. It's really uh, worth uh, a read. With this, I hand over to Claudia Bras from the Banco de Portugal for uh, her um, comments and uh, discussion points. Claudia, over to you. Yes. So, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much, Ernest, for the for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And also because it gave me the opportunity, of course, to read this very interesting uh, report. Okay, I have to start with the usual disclaimer. So the views here are my own, so not those of Bank of Portugal, neither the, the EU system. So as, as, as Fatos just mentioned, uh, the report is uh, organized in, in, in three uh, chapters. Um, I think that we all had the opportunity in this uh, half an hour to, even for those that haven't read it, that, to see how, how impressive the work is and how, how rich the content uh, is. In, in particular, because, and this is one point that I would like to highlight, I think that it benefits from a unique database. So the fact that it's anchored on this annual survey on government uh, borrowing needs uh, gives uh, indeed uh, um, and data that as far as as i as i know it's not uh, available uh, anywhere else so even if you uh, do not think at the oecd think at the, at the european union level and if you go into the for instance the ecb data warehouse or even the eurostat you won't find that that sort of data in particular because it also uh, encompasses the future so it also has as, as projections <clears throat> 
Uh, so uh, the two, I would say, well, more special chapters are, of course, interesting. So very interesting. So the one on the ESG, ESG practices, uh, uh, for me, it was a pleasure reading, and I think I learned a lot. So it was very important to uh, make a, a very good uh, stock taking on how the, the these ESG practices uh, is going, and the progress is already huge, at least. Uh, as far as I'm, I'm aware of, and on this on this second chapter, I would just like to make a, um, a small point, uh, and this because of my my specific interest, because we know that the ECG practices, of course, have a lot many benefits, but one particular uh, uh, benefit I, I, I'm a bit hoping is that it, it could also bring a positive spillover to governments in the sense uh, of. Um, forcing uh, governments to make a more careful uh, uh, presentation of, of, of measures, of projects, and also a bit uh, the ex post assessment of those projects, uh, because it's something that uh, in many countries is, is, is missing. So the, the ex ante analysis for sure, the, the ex ante classification, but also the ex post. So, and as some of these uh, label bonds indeed they have these strong requirements in terms then of the of the of what has to be then uh, delivered by governments i think this will be also uh, an additional benefit and this is mentioned in the report by the way i'm just focusing on it a bit because of my of my interest so i will not go on um uh, emerging market economies this means that i will focus a bit my my comments on on the first chapter let me move the slide so and, and and this was a point highlighted by by, by Fatos in in the presentation. So um, the fact that the report doesn't take into account the recent developments and 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 uh, the recent conflict between uh, Russia and, and and Ukraine, and I have to tell you because I think that uh, I also experienced a bit from 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 that in particular in the context of of of, of my working group is that these are terrible times for those that have to make projections because the environment is rapidly changing and of course reports take a while to uh, to put together and then when you come uh, and indeed uh, manage to publish them they're they're to some extent they they seem to be a bit outdated because uh, because the circumstances uh, changed and and this and this is why i made this in the next slide just to say that uh, regarding, in particular, two uh, important fiscal indicators, so and I'm going to focus on the budget balance uh, ratio to GDP and the debt ratio, it's not that entirely the case. So th this first one here focuses on, on the budget balance. And you see here on, on the left-hand chart, uh, indeed, uh, as, a, as, a, as a black line, the, the OECD current uh, projection for, for the budget balance, and this is a simple average of the data that it's available on the, on the OECD uh, Economic Outlook database. And then you see as a dotted line what we had in December, so the, the basis for, 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 for the report. And what you see is that even though, of course, uh, the, we have uh, higher inflation, uh, deterioration in macro prospects and, and, and the conflict and so uh, all, all that, the perspective for the budget balance on average, it's better than it was uh, in December. So, and this is an outcome which I think it's sort of non-standard, that's why I'm highlighting it. And this comes to a large extent from the outturn in 2021. So what happened is that you see is that the auto turn was much better than 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 expected, and it is by almost two percentage points on on average, uh, and this is not uh, I would say sort of a mistake made by the by the OECD. This this came across all projections, so official projections, Commission, IMF, Euro system. So this was indeed across across the board, and the point is that. Although now the prospects are, are, are worse than before, uh, this base, this uh, favorable base effect uh, uh, allows to have this result that I was that I was just just mentioning. And the the, the, the chart on the right hand side shows exactly the same. So the dots are the countries. So you see that most of the countries indeed expect a, a better improvement from 2020 in their budget balance. Some expect a deterioration, but not by as much. So they are very close here to the 45 degree line uh, and, and and indeed there is then a small group of countries that expect a, a less favorable outcome than, uh, than than before of course that we are only looking at the level of of the budget balance here 
And one thing that we can say is that, well, but uncertainty is huge, of course, and heterogeneity is also huge. So, and I try to capture a bit uh, this part of the dispersion here with the 25 to 75 percentile. Uh, so, you can see that, of course, with COVID, uh, the dispersion on outcomes uh, and fiscal outcomes increased substantially. And now, now it seems to be more or less, well, it's reduced a bit, but not by as much returning to the, the previous dispersion that we had before. Uh, and, of course, I don't have the picture here, but if we, if we look at the December uh, range, it would be uh, tighter. So, indeed, now there's higher uncertainty and higher uh, dispersion on, on fiscal outcomes. And regarding public debt, it's, it's a bit the same. Of course, it, it's a stock. So, you see that since the beginning of, of the 20s, there was always a high, a high dispersion on, on, on public debt uh, um, uh, results in, 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 in each country. Uh, in, in OECD countries, of course, this is, and also at your area level, uh, or this, this also relates to the, to the fragmentation that, that Ernest was, was mentioning in his initial uh, um, uh, remarks. But again, you see here that uh, regarding uh, the, um, the, the December projection, the June uh, projection indeed envisages on average uh, 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 a better outcome. Of course, but and this benefits uh, also something that that was mentioned by 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 by, by you is that uh, on on the one hand I just showed that fiscal balances are not uh, are, are not worse so this is sort of the, the numerator and on the denominator of course inflation and uh, um, GDP deflator of course plays a, a bigger role and to some extent probably uh, bigger than the deceleration that we are uh, expecting on, on, on real GDP. So, the denominator effect here is, is very relevant. And on the right-hand side, I try also to, to show a bit by uh, the result by, by, by country. And of course, uh, you all know that essentially because also of this, of this denominator effect, Countries that have higher debt ratios, of course, were also those that have their, their higher increases uh, due to the pandemic. But, but the point is that now they are also the ones that are expecting higher reductions. Okay, so, uh, so this is exactly what the chart is showing. I just put here the case of Italy and Greece because, as you all mentioned, and due to the behavior of financial markets in, in the last weeks, they are a bit on the spot, these countries. Uh, but just to let you know that, well, according to the projections, of course, with all the uncertainty, and these are baseline projections, and there are all sorts of risk scenarios, but according to the projections, if they materialize, in principle, these will also be the countries that will, that will uh, record faster reduction in debt ratios. So, if that was the case, why did markets react so adversely uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the last couple of weeks, uh, particularly after the announcement of the, the, the changes in monetary policy? And so, to some extent, why, why do fragmentation risks uh, subsist? And here, I'm, I'm a bit narrowing now uh, to, uh, to, to, to the euro area. Well, I think we all know that financial markets reaction is unstable, so that they, they more or less show that. So, uh, up to the financial crisis, uh, they, they, were, they were essentially uh, muted, not reacting at all. Then, of course, with the financial mar markets and the, the sovereign debt crisis, uh, they reacted, well, to some extent a bit abruptly. Uh, and, and to some extent also uh, probably over overreacting. And, and since then, I think that what we have been observing uh, is that they, they, they react uh, 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 to some extent in a, a somehow in a stable manner, and sometimes uh, they appear to be overreacting, even given the, 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 the circumstances. Because fragmentation means exactly that. So it means that financial markets are differentiating countries when, to some extent, there was nothing in their fundamentals. That would uh, uh, that would uh, uh, trigger such sort of, of 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 reaction, and 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 what you know is that well many factors concur to to uh, that sustainability risks. So so probably markets were now uh, reacting a bit to, uh, to 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 uncertainty. They were not reacting to the to of course that I showed to recent uh, projections for for uh, debt ratios or the or deficit ratios. It was not that effect, but the fact that that is that well 
they they, they, they do react to many other factors and uh, uh, the fact that many other factors are relevant, I think, uh, is also uh, um, embedded in the way that the debt sustainability uh, frameworks have evolved. They take into account not only fiscal variables, they take into account macroeconomic variables, uh, the role of institutions, uh, governance indicators. So all these seems to be to be relevant. And I would say that on top of all this, there's the reputation. So uh, countries uh, that indeed uh, in the past showed some uh, fiscal misconduct and this fiscal misconduct uh, uh, translated into higher debt ratios, uh, they are to some extent the first to be penalized. So what it is indeed sort of the recommendation. So the recommendation is that well, prudent fiscal policies should be followed, in particular for those that are, are the most the most vulnerable uh, countries. And regarding this particular contest, I think that the the, the free teas uh, uh, that uh, come up often when you think on the intervention of fiscal policies uh, are, are also should also be applied in in the current context where uh, uh, energy prices are increasing, uh, other goods prices are increases. Uh, uh, there is this uh, a war related environment, and the three T's that that I'm, I'm speaking about is that fiscal policy should be timely. So, and if we look now at, at the, the, the measures that the government have been adopting, even since the pandemic, they seem to be timely. But they should be also targeted. And on these, I'm not entirely sure that the recent policies are targeted. So when we think at compensation, for instance, for the rising on energy crisis, we would like the measures to address the, the groups of economic agents that are more vulnerable. So vulnerable households, uh, uh, firms that are in difficulties, and when you look at the measures that have been now adopted, uh, at your area, they, they account for around 1% of GDP on, on, on average. They are not entirely targeted to these most vulnerable uh, economic agents. So this is important. I think that moving forward, they probably should be targeted and temporary. And this remains to be seen. So uh, there will be the need to uh, reverse these measures once the conditions today uh, apply uh, are not there anymore. Uh, and in particular, when, when you think at uh, uh, the, the, the rise on, uh, um, sorry, the, the reduction on uh, tax on oil products, that it's almost across the board in almost all, all, all countries, uh, the reversal of this is going to be complicated for governments probably. And also there's the part of the environmental part. So this goes exactly against the other objective which is our, the medium term objective on the climate transition. So, so this is a bit, uh, I think, with more implications than the ones that are, that we are just now just now observing. So with this, for sure we need fiscal rules. So, uh, um, so uh, given that this uh, reaction of financial markets is unstable, so it's good to have the peer pressure of, of, of financial markets for sure. But it's not enough to, to have them. So, uh, so fiscal rules are, are needed, probably uh, um, quantified fiscal rules. And this is, of, of course, my, my, personal, my personal opinion. Uh, uh, and, but th this should be there to, uh, to help uh, governments conducting their, their policies and also for ensuring credibility. I'm, I'm probably over, overriding a bit my time, right, Ernst? Uh, so let me go quickly a bit on, on, on this. So, so when I mentioned that many variables, of course, are important for um, to assess a bit sustainability fiscal risks, and Fatos already explained this this, this very well. So uh, the, the 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 debt structure in terms of the of the the, the rate uh, the fixed rate or variable rate composition, indexation mechanisms, the maturity, uh, the holders. And then uh, Fatus also also mentioned this uh, very well. So this shifting on invest, investor investor base that we now can anticipate a bit on with the changes on on, on monetary policy, uh, the currency because there are also most of the times also exchange rate rate uh, um, risks uh, involved. So all these all this is important, and all these of course will affect countries very differently. Um, 
And uh, the, with the chart, I was just trying to highlight the chart is only for the EU area, but but I think that the, the, the chart is quite striking because I'm not sure if everybody is aware of this, but how differentiated even in the area, area situations are. So these are interest payments. So we can have a group of countries where interest payments still wait around 2.5% of GDP, and then we can have another group of countries where interest payments are around 0.5% of GDP. So this is quite striking, and of course the same applies to the implicit interest rate. Um, so this combined, of course, with with the different debt structure means that countries will gradually, of course, suffer with with this interest rate environment, but in a very differentiated way. And, but one thing, so I think that the most probably important lesson that we have to extract from here is that, well, the, 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 the time where interest payments were declining is over. So for the time being, so I think that we can now more or less expect a sort of a stable interest payments, slightly increasing the interest payments, but that sort of leeway. Uh, uh, that countries had on, on the management of their other fiscal policies now probably in the, in the next years will come to an end. So this is important and this is something that, of course, governments are hopefully uh, aware, aware, aware of. And this leeway was indeed important because even in the context of the stability and growth pact, the objectives there were for the overall balance, so not for the primary balance. So this was, uh, to some extent, uh, a leeway that allowed governments to divert the savings on interest expenditure to other types of expenditure. So, but let me conclude here, and I have to conclude with a, with a suggestion. So I'm not I'm not sure if this is feasible, but for me, I think it would be uh, quite an interesting piece of uh, of information because. I don't think it, it's really available anywhere to have some sort of quantified information on, on cash buffers. Because Fatos mentioned, and indeed, they are, they are sort of uh, quite important, uh, in particular in quite unstable times like, like these ones. And I can tell you that when we look at the, the, the composition of the debt ratio and we look at deficit debt adjustments, we know, oh, of course, th but this makes sense because we know countries uh, increase their deposits and uh, oh, no, behind these, there's the intention by debt management offices to increase uh, uh, the cash buffer, um, but uh, we don't have the actual data for that. So having it, it would be it would be it would be great, and it would even allow to to, to I think interpret a bit here on the right hand side the, this chart highlighted here because there are these big differences between the general government deficit and the central government uh, net borrowing requirement, and I would say that probably uh, cash buffers also here play play an important role, and that's it. Uh, sorry for being a bit too long. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Claudia. So I take along great praise for FATO's important work. And, you know, it raises even further wishes, you know, with good work, it's always like this, that it raises further wishes. I think in the interest of time, I would change plan and hand over immediately to Maria and then to Martin and then uh, FATO's, you comment on all three, if that's fine. Okay. So Mar Maria, over to you. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity today to discuss with you uh, this uh, impressive publication from OECD on the uh, sovereign borrower outlook. Uh, I would like to focus on uh, some key topics from an investor point of view. So DSM, as an investor, our team is uh, responsible for uh, managing 80 billion of the SM paid in capital. We also invest uh, the liquidity management portfolios. Our investments uh, focus on highly rated securities uh, issued by sovereigns, uh, by sub-sovereigns, agencies, supranational entities, and uh, we can also buy covered bonds. The main currency of our investments is uh, the euro, and uh, we also invest in other currencies on a fully cashed basis. Uh, so now, uh, with this uh, short background, I want to turn to some of the key findings uh, in the first chapter on the Global Sovereign Outlook. And then I will uh, also spend a few minutes on the second chapter on uh, ESG, uh, which is a very interesting topic for everyone, uh, topic of focus. Uh, what we see in the report, it is evident uh, how all countries have been uh, impacted very similarly by the uh, pandemic, driven by support measures uh, by all governments across the world, uh, 
we have uh, seen these uh, growing uh, borrowing requirements and uh, marketable debt has increased uh, to record levels while borrowing costs uh, have uh, been historically low. And of course, uh, many countries have used this market environment to extend uh, their uh, maturity of the debt, as uh, Fatos mentioned, uh, especially last year. Uh, it was a very unusual and uh, very favorable at the same time combination of increased supply, uh, lower cost, and uh, the possibility to issue at uh, higher maturities. And uh, this was uh, to a large extent possible due to the uh, uh, asset purchase programs that were implemented by many uh, central banks across the world, including uh, the European Central Bank. Uh, so now we come uh, to the end of uh, this uh, environment. Uh, uh, we are witnessing a reversal in 2022. Um, as in the report, it is uh, pointed out, uh, this uh, end of asset purchases will increase the free flow of sovereign bonds and uh, will put up additional upward pressure on yields. Uh, so what we expect is that uh, faced with uh, this increased funding cost uh, and uh, a major market player going out, uh, reducing participation and completely stopping purchases, the central banks, the governments may need actually to uh, shorten the average maturity of their issues by focusing on uh, the shorter end of the curve. Uh, we've seen as well uh, that uh, with uh, increasing inflation, which uh, didn't, which proved uh, much more uh, consistent uh, the, and uh, some other uh, risk factors that appeared uh, recently. Uh, we've seen a much more abrupt and uh, steep uh, increase in yields than uh, was uh, initially expected. Um, so we have uh, in the past few weeks uh, globally witnessed this very steep upward yield movement. Um, that affected uh, all major markets. And uh, I would say only Japan uh, is uh, very little affected because there the uh, Bank of Japan is uh, still sticking to its uh, purchase programs and uh, yields have moved uh, relatively little. Uh, but at the same time, the Bank of Japan the volume of purchases is running at uh, record high. The magnitude and the speed of this interest rate adjustment uh, has surpassed uh, the uh, yield, upward yield cycle that we witnessed in uh, 1994, and uh, it is possible that we still haven't seen the top. Such poor performance of uh, global bond markets uh, is uh, very challenging for both the issuers and for investors. From the investor point of view, this uh, market volatility and uh, yield increase uh, put pressure on the fixed income portfolio mark to market valuation and uh, on the risk metrics. So even when uh, the issuers, uh, uh, when the investors have reduced uh, their uh, interest rate risk, their portfolio duration, volatility based uh, portfolio risk measures continue to show increased risk and require additional uh, reduction of positions. This forced selling of securities amplifies the upward yield movement, uh, even when the market already may appear oversold. So with uh, limited risk-taking capacity and accumulated uh, portfolio mark-to-market losses, investors uh, naturally reduce their participation in primary market operations and also their buying operations in secondary markets. They have limited appetite to take new positions and even uh, low risk activity like switching from off the run security to the new benchmark is not attractive when depending on the financial reporting methodology, selling the old security may lead to uh, realizing sizable loss. These market dynamics uh, is particularly difficult for primary dealers. And uh, Patos uh, uh, pointed out that this uh, should be a key focus uh, for sovereign issuers, uh, how to help primary dealers in this environment, because they need to absorb the secondary market selling from investors. And at the same time, uh, 
to uh, absorb uh, the new supply that comes uh, in the primary market uh, from the issuers. Um, and uh, they also have uh, constrained risk taking capacity because uh, they use the same uh, volatility based uh, risk measures. As a result, uh, the market liquidity progressively deteriorates. Uh, we see wider bid offer spreads, reduced trading volumes, unreliable screen prices. And uh, when there is a bigger transaction, uh, we see large repricing of the uh, secondary market curve uh, across maturities. So I must mention this is not all uh, one directional. There are also uh, in this challenging market some positive effects for sovereign borrowers. As uh, yields have increased, uh, it's uh, quite uh, possible that real money investors uh, actually increase uh, their allocation to uh, sovereign securities. First, in uh, an environment that uh, is uh, so uncertain, um, Sovereign bonds are often uh, used as a safe haven, uh, so it is quite possible that uh, many investors uh, just uh, stick to the sovereign market. And uh, second, after being pushed into lower credit quality products for several years due to the very low interest rate environment, some investors at these higher yields that we see now may increase uh, their uh, allocation uh, to sovereign bonds. And uh, what was also uh, pointed out by FATUS, uh, this flexibility in the funding plans in this environment is extremely important. Issuers should be prepared to adapt uh, their funding uh, operations even intraday sometimes. Uh, so, one way, of course, is uh, these increased cash buffers uh, by uh, uh, having already a comfortable liquidity position. They may decide to skip or to reduce the size of certain issues uh, in challenging uh, market conditions. Uh, also, adapting the maturity of the issues at higher yields and uh, with uh, so uh, fast increasing yields, many investors uh, would prefer to focus on the shorter end of the curve, uh, potentially diversifying and altering the product mix, uh, so including more inflation-linked securities, uh, potentially floating rate notes, uh, which have not been much in fashion in the past few years, private placements, uh, diversifying uh, the issuance in terms of currency, uh, so that uh, they reach out to different investor types and distribute the impact across a wider range of buyers. And then at the same time, it is important to maintain regular market presence, uh, so not to completely revamp uh, the uh, pre-announced issuance plans, because the regular market presence also facilitates price discovery in the in illiquid markets, it uh, helps to maintain actually market access also to the lower credit quality issuers that are priced against uh, the sovereign curve. And uh, it is reassuring for the investors to see that the issuers can uh, still uh, execute uh, their funding plan as announced uh, despite uh, unfavorable market conditions. Uh, the cash buffers can also be used proactively to uh, reduce the pressure on the primary dealers uh, by organizing buybacks uh, or by uh, uh, doing uh, other type of uh, exchange operations uh, that would uh, support uh, the uh, reduction of excess inventory of certain bonds or in general of uh, bonds uh, for the primary dealers. Now, uh, conscious of time, I will turn to the second chapter, ESG considerations, which have become a major part of the investment decision pro uh, process for uh, many investors. And sovereign issuers, it was very interesting to uh, see uh, how they are increasingly active uh, with different initiatives that are detailed in the report. Um, it is a rapidly developing area and, of course, this presents uh, some challenges uh, to uh, the issuers. They need to keep up uh, with uh, different approaches that are used uh, by the investors for ESG integration. 
um, with the evolving international and local standards, uh, reporting requirements, and also methodologies that are used by rating agencies and by specialized TSG data providers. One important development for us is this uh, growing sovereign issuance of uh, use of proceeds bonds. We've seen last year record uh, size issued by sovereigns, and it was mirrored also by record uh, size of uh, global uh, ESG linked issuance uh, by uh, across uh, types of, invest of uh, issuers. So uh, these programs are actually uh, helpful as pointed out uh, in the report uh, to align the uh, borrowing operations with the government ESG policy agenda and uh, to develop ESG markets in general and meet investor demand. From the investor point of view, it is very positive development uh, for the market, I would say, uh, because it improves liquidity, pricing transparency and the availability of uh, such instruments. Uh, this uh, uh, increase in supply has also uh, allowed uh, the ESM, especially in uh, sovereign issues, but also other high credit quality uh, SSA names uh, in benchmark sizes. It has uh, helped us to progressively increase our investments in use of proceeds bonds, uh, which reached about 10% uh, of our portfolio at the end of 2021. And at uh, the same time, many investors, including us, are looking to go beyond uh, this use of proceeds bonds uh, in terms of ESG integration. Uh, when we analyze and uh, measure the ESG contribution of uh, our portfolios um, and uh, for other investors as well, the focus is increasingly moving to the issuer level and not uh, so much on uh, specific bonds. A key challenge for this approach is the availability of consistent data that covers a broad issuer universe. Over the past few years, traditional rating agencies have increasingly started adding ESG related factors to their overall rating assessment and publishing analysis of relevant ESG factors for different issuers. And alongside them, uh, specialized TSG data providers have gained prominence and uh, they focus specifically on assigning scores to different issuers across the E, the S and uh, G dimension on a more granular level. Uh, so sovereign DMOs would need as well to keep a close eye on uh, those uh, new data providers to understand uh, their methodologies, uh, their data requirements, and uh, to ensure that uh, they achieve consistent scoring that uh, uh, reflects uh, their initiatives uh, correctly. Uh, this work comes on top of the compliance with uh, reporting requirements and uh, the enhanced investor relations dialogue uh, on ESG topics. In this area, I should say, investors also had to uh, step up their efforts, engaging with the issuers and uh, with the primary dealers uh, um, to ensure that uh, the investor ESG initiatives are considered uh, during the allocation process uh, of uh, use of proceeds, bonds, uh, syndicated primary transactions. I will stop here. Um, one. Uh, a remark or suggestion that I can uh, give to Fatos, uh, something that I would find interesting uh, for a future report, is maybe to give some more details about uh, the use of derivatives uh, and uh, hedging uh, by the DMOs. I've seen that uh, some of them have reflected in the comments uh, uh, the use of uh, derivatives uh, briefly. So it would be interesting to gather more information and to understand more uh, what they do in that area. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria, for this practitioner's hands-on perspective, a very forward-looking perspective also, which is very useful for our purposes here. I now move on to Martin, who again provides, a, let's say, European policymakers or watchdog perspective. Thank you very much, Ernest, and uh, good afternoon to um, colleagues. Uh, 
So let me start by um, commending um, uh, Fatos and uh, her team for an excellent uh, report. It's, it's a very timely report. It's very comprehensive. It's uh, very uh, well uh, written. So I can only echo the praise that uh, has been uh, mentioned uh, by previous uh, speakers. As Ernest uh, already indicated, uh, for uh, obvious reasons, I will focus on, on chapter uh, chapter one and uh, the usual uh, disclaimer, the usual disclaimer applies. The report comes, I believe, at a, a very crucial moment in time. Uh, maybe it was not anticipated fully, but uh, it, it certainly comes at a crucial point uh, in time uh, for public finances, but for macroeconomic policy making in general. Uh, what I mean here is that we are uh, in the middle of a transition uh, from, a, uh, from years of uh, very low uh, inflation and very accommodative uh, monetary policy and are heading towards uh, years or a period of, uh, of high inflation uh, that we already observe uh, towards monetary tightening in some countries uh, already started quite forcefully in the euro area. Uh, the announcement, the important announcements have been uh, have been made. And all this is, uh, is taking place against the background uh, of uh, increasing demand on public finances. So times are getting uh, tougher in a way, if you like. Market conditions are getting more difficult uh, and monetary policy uh, is getting tighter. At the same time, the, the, the pressure on public finance is increasing. We have the war in Ukraine. We have uh, uh, the green and the digital transition not to forget the uh, demographic um, uh, aging that is also still uh, still there, has been coming for a long time and still there, although it's no longer mentioned that often. So we are in this in this very difficult moment and therefore the report um, uh, comes comes at a crucial uh, at a crucial moment. Now my understanding of uh, um, of the timing of the survey that underpins this excellent report, is that it, uh, it was done actually uh, before uh, the war in Ukraine started uh, and was completed before the war in Ukraine started, so the 24th of February this uh, year. Now, my question, my third question then when I read the report uh, was actually, since, since the report is, is, is actually very candid and um, I found that actually quite, uh, quite, um, quite uh, um, an important feature of this report, so given that the uh, um, report is right, uh, already quite candid, would, uh, would the messages and the conclusions uh, that are uh, highlighted in, in the report, especially in chapter 1.7, um, uh, would these, uh, these messages have been changed or would they have become more forceful uh, after, uh, after 20, uh, 24th of uh, February? So if, let's say, the survey had taken place or completed after the 24th of uh, uh, February. The report looks at a wide range of uh, uh, funding features uh, that are normally not included in uh, well, what I would call conventional public finance reports, so the ones that I typically come across in my, in my daily, uh, in my daily uh, work. Now, what uh, the, the graph that I found particularly telling for the, let's say, uh, the years before the transition that I um, alluded to before is, is reported here on this slide. Uh, Fatos uh, had it also in her presentation, and it's essentially the, the distribution of, um, of bond issuance by yield category. Okay, and you see that in, uh, in the years uh, uh, after the end of the global financial crisis and in in the euro area after the sovereign debt crisis, um, uh, debt management agencies or sovereigns, they, they have, uh, let's say, increased uh, quite significantly or they have, uh, have a large share of, um, of fixed rate bonds uh, with very low uh, rates. Now, uh, these are, of course, uh, numbers, uh, distributions based on nominal rates. And um, the reason why there is this uh, higher share uh, for your area countries, um, uh, so the dark, the dark blue share, it has of course to do that in uh, in the your area we had uh, much lower inflation um, uh, in the uh, in the years up to 20, 2019. So I was wondering whether 
uh, where the OECD also looked at, let's say, the, this uh, distribution in terms of uh, real rates. I mean, it's it's a it's the, the share of let's say uh, zero to one uh, percent yields for for the United States and Canada is is also very high. Mm, they don't have uh, they don't have these uh, negative rates, but I guess uh, as I said, this is because of this difference difference in in, in inflation rates in the run up to pan to the pandemic um, and uh, and more recent events. By the way, this is these are the numbers. But for 2021. 20, now, the uh, the developments that underpinned uh, um, this uh, this distribution are, and uh, here are I'm referring to what the previous speakers already mentioned. They are coming to an end. We are moving towards uh, different uh, different environments, and I have tried to illustrate that with uh, this graph. So this is not taken uh, from the uh, report. This is taken from the ECB. And it shows uh, the the yields um, for uh, the four big uh, euro area economies, and you see this um, fairly sharp um, increase at the right uh, at the right end uh, of the graph, which reflects uh, broadly speaking uh, two developments. First of all, inflation is going up, and uh, the ECB is now increasing rates, but this is maybe now less visible here in this in this presentation, but uh, it is in the data. You also have uh, uh, widening spreads. So the difference between, if I take now the uh, the two polar cases here on the left, Germany in the legend uh, and uh, Italy in the right. So the difference between the dark blue line and the uh, and the gray line uh is also is also increasing beyond beyond the general increase uh, of rates that uh, was already mentioned before so markets uh, market sentiment uh, is changing so markets are reassessing if you like they are reassessing uh the uh, the risks uh, of uh, sovereigns now um previous speakers they have already mentioned that markets uh, they tend to change their assessments uh, rather abruptly. Uh, one may ask the question whether they, this is always based on uh, fundamentals, and that's, uh, these are, of course, uh, very um, pertinent uh, observations, questions. Um, I just wanted also to show that this time um, there is also some uh, something goes beyond, let's say, pure sentiment. This is a graph that shows the evolution of uh, the uh, assessment uh, in the Commission um, sustainability uh, risk assessment. Okay, so you have on the left side you have the evolution across different vintages of um, of reports, the the changing risk assessment for the medium term, and then on the right hand side you have that for uh, the long term, and you see green is low risk. Uh, um, yellow, orange is medium, uh, and high is is red. And you see, starting from the debt sustainability monitor that was issued, the last one before uh, before the pandemic uh, started, you see that the the green part of these bars uh, is uh, is shrinking, while the the red part is is increasing, uh, or and the, and the orange part now. I'm stressing this because, unlike as I mentioned before, for uh, for markets, one uh, conceivably assumes or one knows, to be more precise, that um, the analysis underpinning uh, this uh, this simple graph is a very uh, involving one. It's a very complex one. It's uh, long term. It looks at many factors. Um, uh, it also involves uh, stochastic analysis. So it's a fairly sound uh, analysis of uh, of uh, sustainability risks and the trend uh, is fairly clear by the way um claudia she mentioned that uh, the outer from 2021 was better than expected and you see this also um hidden here in the um uh, the two the two bars uh, of the of the two uh, panels from from the right so the the fiscal sustainability report of 2021 and uh, and the spring forecast uh, 2022 update. You see that the 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 red part uh, has uh, has declined a little bit, uh, 
also um, less, although less visible also for the long term. And what explains this is that in 2021, indeed, we had higher than expected revenues. So we speak of uh, revenue windfalls. And um, some uh, member states, typically those that are uh, benefiting from these windfalls, they would argue that um, that the, these, uh, these revenue windfalls are actually not windfalls, but they are more of a structural nature. Other, other would argue that this is uh, rather like uh, the, a windfall as defined, namely uh, something unexpected and uh, short term. This just to say that to complement the main message that let's say that even a very involved uh, risk assessment shows, uh, shows a trend uh, towards a higher risk that also within this, this uh, more sophisticated, uh, sophisticated uh, assessment, you still have um, uh, elements of judgment uh, and, uh, and they are, as I said, reflected, reflected here in this, in this little um, and, simple, and simple graph. Debt management agencies and, and sovereigns, they have not been idle in the years before, before the pandemic and, um, and, uh, and more recent events. Uh, I show again the graph uh, with the change, uh, the change of the average maturity. But at the same time, and here I would like to stress the point uh, that uh, was made by, um, uh, by Fatos. At the same time, so on top of the very positive uh, aspect, namely that maturities have increased and therefore the pass through of higher, higher rates that we will inevitably now see, that we have a very high uh, rollover needs. So in the OECD as a whole, it's 40% in the next three years is, uh, is quite a big number. And if I understood Fatus correctly, it's, it's, it's really quite a, an unusually uh, big number because, because the debt, government debt has, has increased uh, as a result of, the, of, the, of these uh, large shocks in the last few years. And in the, in the euro area, uh, it is, it is a, a somewhat uh, uh, lower, but still, uh, still um, above 30%, including in countries, in countries like Italy, um, which are at the center of um, attention, uh, attention right now. Now, this brings me to, to, my, last, uh, uh, to my last slide, uh, which tries to summarize um, uh, graphically, uh, I think the, the main challenges that the report uh, highlights uh, very nicely. So we are in this transition from, uh, let's say, a more benign environment to a more challenging environment. We have interest rates that are increasing and we have a quantitative tightening. So no longer QE, but uh, Q uh, T government deficits are still are still high, and as I as I indicated earlier, the the demand on on government is uh, is increasing, and at the same time, uh, although from a purely let's say technical uh, perspective, um, there's no problem with the financing uh, financing higher uh, demand on government expenditure with higher revenues. In the debate, this is uh, unfortunately uh, absent, but understandable. We are in this in this difficult moment uh, created by uh, by the war in Ukraine. So uh, everyone is focusing on the higher uh, spending needs, uh, but for possibly for political reasons, or probably good political reasons, um, uh, no one is speaking about uh, the need then to finance uh, to to balance these higher uh, higher demands on government uh, uh, expenditure with higher uh, revenues, and then. Just again, the significant uh, rollover needs, uh, rollover needs um, that I have to say personally, and that was one of the, let's say, uh, main insights for me. Of course, I'm familiar with the concept, but the number, I find it uh, quite, uh, uh, quite impressive. And then Claudia, she, um, she mentioned it, uh, she alluded to it, but in this, in this transition that I, um, that I mentioned, I think, the current situation that we have in, uh, in Europe, namely the de facto suspension of uh, EU fiscal rules, uh, may be a problem um, when markets are getting a bit uh, more cautious, uh, if, not, if not nervous. So I think, um, I think returning to a rules-based system that gives um, clarity to markets uh, about where um, fiscal policy is going or where, let's say, the policy advice at least is trying to, um, to, to push um, policymakers, uh, 
this this would uh, uh, certain uh, certainly help in a in a context uh, where markets are starting to uh, reassess uh, sovereign risks. I don't see let's say a general problem with that, but uh, it was mentioned by um, uh, by several uh, implicitly. Uh, markets are starting um, to differentiate more now between uh, between sovereigns, even within uh, uh, within the euro area. So I conclude again by. Uh, by congratulating um, uh, the OECD for this uh, fantastic report, and maybe um, come back to this question: uh, Would you, would, would your, would your conclusions uh, have been more forceful had the uh, had the survey uh, been completed uh, um, uh, say after uh, after the 24th of uh, February? Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Martin. I think, in the interest of time. We just uh, return to Fatos for a few replies. I take along. Uh, there are demands for cash management management data. Uh, there's the request to include derivatives, and now Martin included a request for intermediate updates of the questionnaire. So, how can you deal with all this? Thank you very much, Ernest, and thank you very much, all Maria. Um, Claudia and Martin, uh, excellent feedbacks indeed, uh, and I'm very happy to, to receive those kind of feedbacks, always relevant for our work. And uh, let me first start with the projections. It's just uncertainty around projections, and it's very much uh, connected with uh, what uh, Martin said. If if the key messages are still uh, relevant, uh, given the the, the uh, current uh, conditions. Uh, first, yes, uh, well, the projections, uh, uh, as mentioned, uh, based on survey and we conducted survey in, in 2021. Uh, at that time, of course, uh, we were expecting higher uh, kind of uh, fiscal performance already was there uh, in, in this, especially in the second half of the year. Uh, we have seen very strong tax receipts in many countries, including US. So, it, of course, it affects their um, their um, the projections. And when we look at the borrowing outlook, what it says, it says they, that we will see a stabilization uh, in, in new borrowing needs. But I, I would like to highlight a few things here. One is that 80%, at least 80% of the total borrowing needs come from uh, existing debt, the redemption. The, the, the amount that needs to be redeemed and it's it doesn't change it's there so it, it is it shows the high exp exposure to to uh, the rising interest rates right and the second is of course uh, the existing level of of debt although uh, as uh, Maria uh, rightly mentioned it's just like we are expecting kind of uh, um, kind of uh, a small, a slight decrease in, in, in that GDP levels, but it's a result of confluence of different factors, right? GDP and then baseline. It, it depends what you compare with, so to speak. And uh, and then also uh, the, uh, the budget deficits uh, planned at the beginning of the 2021, revised in, in the middle of 2021, and then also uh, the, uh, the actual numbers as of 2021, they were completely different. Of course, it's just, the, the situation was uncertain for many countries because uh, first the, the pandemic related measures, um, they were uh, kind of uh, expecting higher uh, borrowing needs because of uh, the pandemic related uh, support measures. But given that uh, the economy is rebounded well in 2021 and then they draw down the, the pandemic related support measures um, significantly. And then but turning to the um, kind of um, impact of the war. Uh, yes, we definitely will see uh, some uh, fiscal policy impact uh, um, of the war because the governments, of course, will try and support uh, consumers and businesses in terms of, you know, to, to against uh, uh, rising uh, energy prices, rising food prices, that, that's for sure. But there is one thing I'd like to mention here. One is that we are expecting this kind of measures uh, mostly uh, done by EU countries, and on the EU side, it's the most. Um, uh, it's not the national uh, budgets. Mostly EU funds will cover. For example, in the economic outlook, it is mentioned that I think uh, the overall um, the support measures against the the war uh, will 
uh, be equal to 0.2 percent, and then this will be funded by EU funds. So it, the, the overall impact of the national budgets will be limited. This is a kind of uh, um, the kind of arbitrage that we are looking at. So uh, therefore, uh, still, uh, if, you, if we ask uh, if the the key messages of the barring outlook is relevant, yes, it is. It's indeed. Therefore, we didn't kind of uh, re uh, redo the, the survey back in um, during the 2020. We did that because the borrowing needs increased sharply and uh, suddenly, and then we felt like 2019 projections were completely irrelevant. So we asked countries to to resubmit their uh, they, their responses. But in this case, first, as I said, uh, we didn't know. Well, I think it's still a bit unknown how much uh, they need to support their uh, businesses and uh, consumers uh, against the, the impact of the war. And then the second thing is, of course, as I said, uh, this is um, expected mostly uh, funded by EU uh, general funds rather than national uh, uh, budgets in, in, in the case of EU. And uh, the second uh, kind of uh, topic that's been mentioned by our panelists is the southern European countries and widening spreads. Um, well, to be honest, we were uh, we, we discussed this in the borrowing outlook. We were expecting investors to become more sensitive to changes in, in macroeconomic uh, kind of uh, uncertainty conditions going forward. Uh, as uh, I think it was Warren Buffett said once, uh, it's uh, you know, his, his uh, famous uh, word on, on, the, uh, on the market conditions, only when the tide goes out, do you, do you consider and discover who is swimming naked? It's uh, just indeed it is what he refers indeed uh, in terms of the sustainability is the interest rate growth differentials. It allows governments to, of course, run high level of uh, that. Uh, it can be managed without leading to sustainability concerns as long as interest rates are low and the and economic growth is strong. But since we are expecting higher rising interest rates and uh, kind of um, um, weaker uh, uh, growth going forward, at least there's some uncertainty there, uh, it's, it was expected that investors would react to, to this condition. However, what we say when we communicate this with investors, market participants, media, we want to highlight the fact that yes, the interest, the debt to GDP levels are higher than uh, per pandemic levels for sure. But then you need to look into the maturities, maturity profiles, also investors, holders, who is holding what? Is, is it a, a kind of um, investors who sensitive to yields or investors um, not sensitive to yields like central banks. And then in the current uh, situation, of course, uh, central banks hold a large uh, share of, of bonds. And this will change. I think also this is part of, this is uh, part of the whole uh, kind of uh, scenario to picture that uh, investors are a bit concerned because uh, the investor, um, the holders profile will change. And given that um, sovereign issuers are price takers, Right, they're not price makers, they are price takers. They will uh, issue their bonds at a higher uh, interest rates. This was kind of expected, but the only thing is just we want this transition to, to happen smoothly. And, uh, and when we look at what's going on in the market today, Italy is definitely is, is taking a much better uh, condition than when we compare to, to 2010-11 periods. It's because that I think when, when I read the, the reports and everything, then now the markets are kind of much more aware of the fact that the Italy's debt, uh, yes, it's, uh, it was 110% uh, of GDP before the pandemic, and then, uh, then now it's close to 150. It's, it's huge, but still, uh, the maturities, uh, maturity profile is much improved and holders profile uh, also uh, very uh, home bias domestic investors are there. So these are really uh, affecting factors. Uh, and then uh, regarding, uh, I think it was Martin mentioned, uh, because since uh, we um, kind of make our calculations based on nominal rates uh, in terms of 
real interest rates, it will be much lower than, of course, the nominal rates in terms of borrowing costs. Yes, that's true. Uh, although we did our calculations based on nominal rates, uh, when you consider inflation, of course, uh, the uh, even in, in US, uh, real interest were, were in, in negative territory. And on the uh, the suggestion uh, on the cash buffers, more information on the cash buffers and use of derivatives, very, very uh, good uh, two points. In fact, uh, um, use of derivatives, uh, they are available on the annexes, uh, in the annexes part, it's just uh, because we ask these questions to, to countries, uh, to what extent they use derivatives. Uh, they provide that kind of information in the primary market uh, survey. And uh, we lay out those uh, survey responses in the uh, in the um, annexes, and cash buffers are uh, very very good question indeed because it, it, it but the thing is it changes uh, during year, and then some countries prefer not to um, kind of um, uh, share this information publicly. This is a uh, one challenge, but. Overall, uh, the the information is available uh, for uh, for many countries on their websites. Why why not uh, going forward? Uh, we can uh, gather that information uh, through the survey. This concludes our webinar on the OECD Sovereign Borrowing Outlook 2022. Thank you very much, Fatos, for your presentation and for being prepared to answer to this cross examination by three very critical experts. Thank you to Claudia, to Maria, and to Martin for providing uh, your insights and your comments, and to all of you for your interest and for participating. Thank you to all. Bye-bye, and take care, and have a nice summer. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.